If you got your Bibles with you this morning, let's go to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to pick up where we left off there. I got two bottles of water now, so you guys was talking about me being late from Sunday school. Just imagine what it's going to be when we get out of here now. Just kidding. Colossians chapter 1. Last week, we talked about the sun's preeminence in creation. This week, we're going to talk about the sun's preeminence in redemption. So Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Actually, I want to drop back to verse 14 and keep our context going. So verse 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So in our last study, I took considerable time and detail in laying out for you the fact that only the Son of God has the credentials to do the things that He does. We looked at His position as both the image of God and also as the firstborn of every creature and concluded that in fact He is God the Creator of heaven and earth and all that therein is. So today... We're going to go just a little deeper into our study and see how he is not only the creator, but he is also the redeemer. So he's the creator God, and he is the redeemer God. So we're going to see the Son as the redeemer, past and present. So... I want to talk about starting out our, the, the redemption past, if you will. In verse 14 that we just read, it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love You and thank You for loving us. Father, once again, we just thank You for the privilege of assembling together here in Your house. Father, I thank You for all the folks that you have here with us today. And Father, I pray for those who cannot be here for uh, different and varied reasons. I think of my wife who's sick, and Karen Hayward who's also sick, Lord, and Alan traveling to see his family, and Lord, a, a trip that he's need to make for a while. And uh, Father, I just think of, of the folks who aren't here because uh, they just don't want to be. And Father, I pray for them that you would touch their hearts, that you would move their hearts, Lord, to get back into the assembling of themselves together, Lord. And Father, I pray just now for all of us who are here, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, that you would open our minds that we might receive what you have for us this morning. And Father, most importantly, that you would open our hearts that we can see it for ourselves and apply it to our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So redemption past. God has always had a plan of redemption for man. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, God set the precedent by covering their sin. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, the Bible says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and covered them. So the precedent was set all the way back in the beginning of man here on earth. Man sins, God covered it. Now you may recall that the man and the woman tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. It wasn't acceptable unto God. The reason is, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. But was that really redemption? My Bible says no, it wasn't. It was a covering of sin. Redemption is a releasing or liberation effected by the payment of a ransom. All of the animal sacrifices made throughout the Old Testament could not pay the required ransom. Take your Bibles. Keep your place here in Colossians. Take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, and we'll go down through verse 10. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood. For he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was the figure of the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Keep this in mind because there were some men in the Old Testament that believed in redemption from sin, not the covering of sin. Job, in Job chapter 19 and verse 23, 
It says, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. Verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. I remember, folks, Job was a contemporary of Abraham. The book of Job was the first book written in the Bible. Job lived before the sacrifices were put in the law. Yet, he was doing sacrifices to God. In Job chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, And so, and it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job's children, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Job had a relationship with God that he knew that God was going to redeem him and that he would see God in his flesh in the latter times. He wasn't the only one. Psalm 19 and verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. David also understood that he had a redeemer that would take away his sin, not just cover it. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> for those of you who have been around me for a while, you've heard me talk about the sure mercies of David. How that even though he committed the sins of adultery and murder, <clears throat> both sins that had no animal sacrifice to cover, yet God had given him mercy. God had himself covered those sins. But it didn't come without a price. Oh, go read the story. It cost him his son. And his eldest son trying to kill him. It came with a price. But David had a heart for God like no other man that's recorded anywhere in Scripture. And God covered his sin. God gave him the sure mercies of David. That's a picture or a type of the very mercy that God showed you and I. See, the biggest difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament is that in the Old Testament, sin was covered and that temporarily. But in the New Testament, sin is taken away. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. And that permanently. Go back to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 10 and going through verse 18. Let's go back to verse 9. 
Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Verse 10, by the, which will, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Once for all. And only once. Damn. I almost forgot to tell you about Job and David. And the rest of the Old Testament saints. See, their redemption had to wait. They knew what they was talking about. If it wasn't going to happen, it would not have been put into Scripture. But it happened. Yes, it did. And I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up. So take your Bibles. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Now I'm not going to dwell on this because when we get to chapter 2, we're going to dwell on it. But right now I just want to, I just want to put it in your mind. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 51. It says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now look at verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And came out of the graves, watch this, after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. When Jesus resurrected, when he came up from the grave, so did the Old Testament saints. David and Job walked in the streets of Jerusalem. Look, the Bible's true. When Job said, I will see my Redeemer in my flesh, I will see God in my flesh, he knew what he was talking about. When David said, I will see my Redeemer, he knew what he was talking about. If it hadn't have been true, we would have never read it in the scripture. There's true. Was redemption past? Let's talk about redemption present. Back in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 18. Through 22. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now we see Jesus, the head of the body, the church. 
But I want to keep us in context here. Because as of yet, the name of Jesus hasn't appeared in our text. It's the Son. The Son. But we know that it's speaking of Jesus. Because verse 18 says, And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in all things he might that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father, verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, look at this, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Amen and amen. Jesus is the Son in the flesh. The church is the body of Christ. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now, I know, I got students of scripture in this room. And right now you say, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor. Lazarus was raised from the dead, was he not? What about the centurion's daughter? Was she not raised from the dead? she was they were both raised from the dead by Jesus as a sign and a testimony to the Jews but neither one of them was raised to eternal life no they wouldn't they all had to face death again Verse 15 of our text says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That so shows that Jesus was the firstborn of the creation. The firstborn of every creature. He is the pattern by which He Himself created everything. I've told you this before. There is nothing on earth or in heaven that is not a pattern or a type in some way of Jesus Christ. From the very simplest thing, and I had the whiteboard up here and I showed you that you take a line, you take your pen and you put a line on the board. And that line has a length, it has a width, and it has a depth. And if you take away any part of that line, you take away the line. Because everything, no matter what you look at, is a, is a type of Jesus Christ, a type of the Godhead. Everything that he created, he created after himself, a pattern of threes. He's the firstborn of every creature. He is the creator of all of the creation. Verse 18 says he's the firstborn from the dead. That's the regeneration. The regeneration. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes. So he's talking to his disciples here. And he says, You're going to follow me in the regeneration. Now, I got a whole message on the regeneration. We're not going to get into that today because that takes over an hour. I don't know, you know, I know how you guys get. I got chastised for going over in Sunday school. I'm not going to do it again this morning. But I'll do that one of these days. 
Titus chapter 3, in case you think this is just for the disciples. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. It says, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us, look at this, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Yes. It's by the washing of regeneration of the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells us that we are washed by the Word of God and we're washed by the Holy Ghost, taking the Word of God and washing us and regenerating us. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit of God took a permanent residence in you. He's not leaving because He has a job to do. Now most of us could learn from that. He has a job to do, and the good thing about the Holy Ghost is He's going to do His job. He's going to regenerate what we have messed up. What got messed up through Adam had to be fixed by somebody. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it, but the blood of God did. But He knew what he was dealing with. Think about this for a minute. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 that before the foundations of the world that our redemption was planned. So I look at it this way because I take things personal. I look at it, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. They're up in heaven drinking coffee. I know God drinks coffee because he's a righteous and holy God and he don't sleep. So they're having coffee. And they're saying, we need to create some stuff. Now son, that's your job. And I want you to create man. And right away, now that this is in my head, right away Jesus said, whoa, hold on Father. I understand what you're saying, but I know the past, the present, and the future. I have full knowledge. And I know that there's a guy that's going to be born in December of 1954 that's going to go to hell. And God says, no, he's not, son. No, he's not. Because you're going to go die and redeem him. And Jesus goes, huh, sounds like a good plan. So he created heaven and earth. And in December of 1954, I was born. I was well on my way to hell when in 1989, the blood of God cleansed me. He saved me. But I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit of God came and indwelled me at that moment. I have no doubt about that. But I'm going to tell you something. In the years since then, he has had to do some washing of regeneration in this old boy. Because I have done some stupid, stupid stuff. And don't you start looking down your nose at me because so have you. And God knew we was going to. So He gave us the Holy Ghost and He gave us the Word of God. And He said to the Holy Ghost, He says, you go down there. Look, my son took his blood, God's blood, and He redeemed that old boy. But you've got to go down there and work in him, man, because he needs it. He's going to make mistake after mistake after mistake. Is he redeemed? Yes, he is. But man, is he a mess. And he needs help. And I love him. And he's mine. Now I'm going to take care of him. I got a job for him. I got a job for him. There's been times when we've had debate about that job he gave me too. He's God. I'm the servant. 
I don't always like it. But at the end of the day, I'm always going to do it. Until he takes my breath from me. I appreciate the fact that before he spoke the first words of creation, he had me on his heart. And he had you on his heart. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. See, the Father's purpose in the Son was that he would have the preeminence over everything. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the very God that became man to redeem us. It pleased the Father. That in Him, the Son, should all fullness dwell. And the Son reciprocated in kind. In John chapter 8 and verse 29, Jesus says, And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. Let me tell you something. I don't do always those things that please Him, and neither do you. But He will never leave us nor forsake us. Right, we just need to do the best we can. And when we mess up, invoke 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we can get right back in the fight. Never give up. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the fullness of the universe. He's the fullness of the church. Let me show you something here. It says that in Him should all fullness dwell. Look in, in Colossians 2.9. My Bible is just one page over. It says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It's all God's. And He's the fullness of it. Psalm 89 11 the heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. So the earth and everything in it is in the fullness of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's not all. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says that He's the fullness of time. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. In John chapter 1 and verse 16, it says, And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. He's the fullness of grace. Yes. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 23 says, Which is the head the fullness of Him that filleth all in all, the church. Look at verse 17 of Colossians 1. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist, and He is the head of the body, the church. We are part of the fullness of Christ. Because the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 2 that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Right now. That's not something that's going to happen later. We're seated there right now. Or well, we're bodily here because we got a job to do. But we're seated in God's mind 
when he sees us, he's seeing his son. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He created it, and then he redeemed it, and it pleased the Father that he controls it. So let's talk about how Jesus secured our redemption. We see that he has, but how did he do it? Verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, verse 22, in the body of his flesh, through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He made peace through the blood of his cross. Peace with the Father. We were enemies. Romans chapter 5 tells us that very clearly. We were enemies, yet He died for us. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. That price was the very blood of God. Don't you take it flippantly. You were bought with God's blood. It says, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You were bought with a price. You are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I get so sick and tired of hearing people say, well, I have my rights. Yeah, you do. You have a right to do what God saved you to do. All right, amen. He spilled His blood. Who the heck are you to tell Him, I got a right to do whatever I want to do? I cleaned that up real quick. I have another word in my mind. It has to do with the place you was headed before He shed His blood to save you. I get, I, 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 man, that bothers me. Listen, I'm an American. I was born here. And I intend to die here if I don't get raptured out first. But I'm going to tell you something. And you can put this one in the bank. My allegiance first and foremost is to God my Father, to His Son Jesus Christ, to His Holy Ghost which indwells me. And then, and then, my family and my country in that order in that order exactly don't talk to me about your rights if you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ talk to me about your responsibility God's blood reconciled all things unto himself. I want you to pay close attention to verses 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Listen to me. God the Father reconciled all things unto Himself by the blood of His Son. Amen. 
Don't tell me you have a right to take that flippantly. You talk to him about it. I guarantee you he has a different attitude. The Father is the one reconciling all things unto Himself. The Son was the source of the reconciliation. I'm telling you, man, there are people that call themselves Christians and they walk around and they, oh, look around you. Where are they? Listen to them talk when they're at work. Where are they? I'm telling you, I'm not mad. I'm just making a point. We were bought with the blood of Jesus. If you, if you, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you accepted His death, His burial, and His resurrection as your own. Read your Bible. I'm telling you, that's what it says. The Bible says over there in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 that it was God's blood that redeems you. Revelation 1.5 says the same thing. You were bought with God's blood. It's my job. It's my job to warn you. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. Because God doesn't. We've had this conversation this week. I got some stuff in my life that I've been doing. It's not bad stuff. Don't, don't get excited. But I've been more focused. Too focused. Not more focused, but too focused on the political things, this political situation that we're in. And God very clearly showed me this week, through this study, that my mind's in the wrong place. Too much. You'll notice that as you look at my Facebook from this point forward. You can send me all the political stuff you want to, but don't expect me to respond to it because I'm not going to. I got to keep my focus where it belongs on the one that redeemed me with his own blood. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 17 through 19 says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That, my friends, is why Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. He's the only one that did always those things that pleased the Father. In the garden, when he was having his, his moment there, and he was saying, Oh, Father, if it, were, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's the attitude, folks. That's doing always those things that please the Father. Not my will, but thine be done. Verse 21, back in our text. It says, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Enemies in your mind by wicked works. 
Therein, my friend, lies the problems with man. We can all do good things if we want to. But our mind is still wicked. Unless, unless and until we allow Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost in us and the Word of God before us cleanse our minds, our mind is going to stay wicked. It's going to stay defiled and corrupt. We must let Jesus have control. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 15 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How you doing? Every thought. Not some of them. I, I'm telling you folks it's every thought everything has to be brought under the obedience of Christ we cannot allow ourselves to have any leeway with our thinking the Bible says as a man thinketh in his heart so is he if we don't bring every thought into obedience of Christ We'll take a little thought that might not be too bad and we'll hold on to it. Well, that wasn't too bad. Well, that's a little worse, but that's still not too bad. Well, I've been thinking about this and I think I'll just go do it. That's the way it works, my friends. That's why we must bring every thought obedience to Christ so our mind is deceitful and wicked verse 22 verse 21 says and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. We are reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. That is why there was no redemption realized in the Old Testament. There was remission of sin, there was covering of sin, but there was no redemption until Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scripture. If Jesus hadn't lived and died in the flesh, there would be no redemption, period. We could still be doing the sacrifices We could still be covering our sin. A lot of us still try to do that sometimes. We'll do something and then we'll say, well, nobody's seen it. I'll just kind of hide that thing. Let me tell you something. It's exactly what Adam and his wife tried to do in the garden. Didn't work for them. And it won't work for you. And it doesn't work for me. So that's how Jesus secured redemption. So why did he secure the redemption? It's very simple. Look at verse 22 again. In the body of his flesh, that's how, to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. 
In whose sight? How about God the Father? That's what this is talking about, isn't it? See, to present you to the Father, it could say. Holy, having the characteristic of God and being sacred to God. Unblameable, without blemish, morally faultless. Now, ask yourself this question. I'm not going to ask you because I don't want you to lie to me. But ask yourself this question. Are you faultless? Are you unblameable in every aspect of your life? Of course not. I answered it for you. But God, through His mercy and through His grace, has told us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not just the, 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 the sin that we so needed to be saved. It's the sin since we've been saved. Now, I, I, heard, I heard a guy say one time, well, you know, I'm saved, therefore I'm sinless. I said, man, there you go lying. You're not. This, this guy was in this church that had this whole doctrine of that. And, and, and their claim was, if you sin, then you know you're not saved. Well, now, if I, it, when, when I ran into this mess... If I hadn't have been saved, I would have thought I'm not saved and I never will be saved. But fortunately, I was saved. And I was growing to the place where I had a little bit of an understanding of my Bible. And I immediately exited the place. Probably they was happy to see me go. I don't know. Unblameable is without blemish, morally faultless. And you get that because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the fact, the fact that you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when God looks at you, He sees His Son. Your sin, now listen to me very closely, because I don't want you to be confused. Your sin your past sin, your present sin, that's for those of you who are mad at me right now, you'll get over it, and your coming sin, were all forgiven at the cross. We confess our sins to God because that restores our fellowship. That restores our relationship. We're still saved. But we're just not in that sweet fellowship that we need with the Father and with His Son. Go read 1 John chapter 1. I don't have time for it today. I'm already going to go along. That's how we're presented to the Father. Like His Son. And then it says unreprovable. That means... There is nothing that can be called into account. In His sight, the Father's sight. When God the Father looks at you and looks at me, He sees His Son. We are in Him and He is in us. Just as we saw last week, the Son is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son. That's why when you see Jesus, you see the Father. I mean, that's what he told Philip, right? He goes, why are you asking me this? You see me, you've seen the Father. Have I been so long with you and you haven't figured that out? He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When you really stop and think about it, we have the Godhead indwelling us. 
Go read John chapter 16 in your spare time. They're all there. It's a promise from God. Why is that? You have God the Son, I'm sorry, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But there's one God in three persons. When you have any one of those one, you have all three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how can that be? Look at yourself. You are a body, a soul, and a spirit. Wherever you are, there you are. Same thing. The Son, our Jesus, what a Redeemer. He has secured our redemption forever by the blood of His cross. But He's given us so much more. Oh, so great a salvation. So great a salvation. Look at verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Jesus Christ has reconciled us in his body and has presented us to the Father perfect, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in everything. All we have to do is stay grounded. Continue in the faith. In other words, be obedient to God who redeemed you. Isn't that something? Your redemption is secure. Your standing in the relationship, we'll be discussing that in future lessons. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's based on your obedience. That's what verse 23 tells us. Look at it again. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. How do you do that? I'll tell you one thing. You don't do it by not reading your Bible. You don't do it by not going to church because the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You do it through obedience. Read the Word. Study the Word. Memorize the Word. Talk to your Father. He saved you so that He could have a relationship with you. Sin separated us. God created man for the purpose of relationship. They lost it day one. God saved us for the purpose of relationship. We can lose it, but we can get it back by being obedient, by confessing our sin, by doing what He saved us to do. Obedience is the key to relationship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Father, we thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture, Lord, which makes it so clear, so clear, that we need Jesus. We need to accept his death, his burial, and his resurrection as our own. Father, we need to be serious about the blood of God that was shed on the cross. And Father, my prayer right now is that anyone that hears this message, 
or the people in the room, the people who watch the video, that they will see the importance of Jesus Christ and their redemption. And Father, I pray that if anyone hears this message and they don't know Jesus Christ as their own, that they would come to know Him. He died for them for that specific purpose. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, in verse 9, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10 says that confession is made unto salvation. That we believe, I'm sorry, we believe unto righteousness and confession is made unto salvation. And verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father God, I just pray that anybody that hears this message will confess to you that you are right and they are wrong. That they believe that Jesus died for their sin that he rose from the grave for their redemption. And Father, that they would ask Jesus into their heart, into their life. Father, I know you will not force yourself on anybody. But Lord, open their minds, open their eyes, open their hearts, that they might receive you just now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.